Hey there, Gerald Fiber Wayne. All right, summer of 2023. So today is uh, Sunday, July the 2nd, and we're going to give you the second kind of overview of what's going on this week for assignment four. This one's much shorter, and uh, um, I apologize. The, the last video was kind of long, but I just wanted to give you the full, uh, a little tiny hematology oncology lecture. Um, uh, I actually have a section of that in my cancer class I'm teaching uh, for the undergraduates next semester and uh, I would love to give you the full lecture but I can't so and I, and we appreciate all the positive vibes um, messages that we've received from from you guys uh, uh, you have to believe in that kind of otherworldly force that helps uh, people heal and, uh, and 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 we have lots and lots of gratitude and have a positive attitude and and, and we're going to be good to go getting through this all right so what I, what I want to do here is go into the um, uh, next week assignment, okay? It's this week, but the next assignment within this week, okay? And that would be assignment number four. And I always want you to remember what it is we've gone through, okay? And uh, what we're going to see is we're going to have lots of repetition, okay? And repetition is key to, you know, consolidating the, the memory and then being able to apply that to your every, our everyday use in the workplace, in how you live your lives. And so that's what today is going to be a little bit more repetition, okay? We introduced to the, the concept of stress, okay? Um, psychological to physiological, okay? We looked at the sociological factors in week one, okay? Uh, we looked at this, this uh, relatively new um, part of science where we're looking at how um, the outside environment, stress, diet, exercise, everything that you choose to do can flip the switches in terms of which genes are turned on and off, and as a result, which proteins are produced, and how that can uh, affect your overall health trajectory, all right? Um, you carry along a history, but you're also moving forward, can can turn on the good genes, okay, and turn off the bad genes, and this this is this concept, okay? So it's always in flux for our 23 pairs of chromosomes, all right? We then went into a discussion of diabetes, and uh, like I said, this is kind of one of the more yeah, immediate effects, okay, and, and diabetes is uh, a, a part of the met metabolic syndrome that has so many trajectories, so if we can just control our diabetes, then we're going to be much better off as a society in terms of controlling the disease process, all right, and uh, we got some hints about you know, what we can do, all right? And, uh, you know, so, you know, things that are under our control. And we're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, towards the end, a lot, a lot more in the last half of class, but, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy approaches. Um, yes, you can see a psychologist, a psychiatrist, but we also have it within ourselves to, uh, to be able to change the course of how we're living our lives and, and change how we are reacting to different stressors, okay? That's kind of the take-home message there. All righty. So um, we can look now. Uh, we're going to do, again, a little bit of um, review here. And uh, we're looking at the, the impact. Okay, and here's, here's one great stress relief. I want to introduce you to my good buddy, dog, Desi. Desi's stretching. Come here, bud. We, we, we um, got rid of stress for him because, see, Desi was a rescue. Okay, and so Desi... Needed a home, and so we gave Desi a home. That was, uh, he's a, uh, almost two. He's a German chair pointer. He's a rascal, okay? He's got lots of energy. And around the corner over there is his sister, and that's Lucy. Yep, there she goes, Desi and Lucy. So we took on a handful, but that's okay. And then, and pet therapy is one of the more amazing ways that you can have cognitive behavioral therapy to to appreciate life and reduce your stress. So, so and you know, some people like dogs, some people don't, but uh, but um, nature provides us these outlets. And that's the bottom line. All right, let's go back to the. I couldn't help Desi keep walking up, so I had to have my little. I have profound ADHD, so you see, I'll have these tangents every once in a while. Okay, so um, so the the topic is we're going to discuss diabetes, but we're just going to reflect also on stress and. Um, and the outward ramification of this, okay? And and this is, you know, a lot of us have anxiety. Um, you know, uh, am I going to be able to pay, pay the bills? I have a little bit of anxiety right now. You know, have I bit off more than I can chew? Um, I know a lot of people elect, and you start talking to your friends, a lot of people elect not to get this surgery and to just move forward. And um, it's kind of, a, you know, it's a, you, you weigh on, 
well, I won't be as strong athletically, but hey, I don't have any recovery time. It's, I mean, my recovery feels pretty good right now, even though it's kind of rolled up. You know, I, it's not, um, I don't feel like I'm having that much disability. And, uh, um, so, uh, but I do know that from when I have surgery, I'm going to be out of commission for, you know, two to three months. So, so that's, a, that's a roll of the dice. So I have a little anxiety about that, okay? Um, I have anxiety about, you know, my children. I have anxiety about a lot of things, all right? Um, and um, and then we have depression and dementia, okay? And stress uh, from anxiety, if you have too much anxiety, okay? And this can be in lots and lots of different directions, you know? Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? That is a severe anxiety condition. Um, can lead to clinical depression and uh, ultimately... It is laying the groundwork for, for dementia late in life if you don't control it, okay? So that's kind of the take-home message on this. Again, this is large-scale epidemiology. We're looking at millions of people. Um, you combine that with the research that's being done both in animals and also in the clinical setting, and you see these tendencies. It doesn't mean it's an, an absolute. You can't look at it that way. But if we look at things on average, then... Um, we know that it dramatically increases risk for depression and dementia. Okay, so that's the way you have to look at this. You know, we we've made some global statements, for for example, about um, abdominal slash visceral obesity. Okay, and again, not everybody that has that is going to have the chronic inflammation that is going to then lead to um, type two diabetes and all the trajectory health consequences. Um, but if we look over hundreds of thousands, millions of people, whatever study you want, studies you want to do, it could do a meta-analysis where you look at all the different reports, it's definitely there, okay? So we want to, you know, hedge, hedge our bets, and we want to do the right thing, and that's the way to look at this, okay? All right, so this is uh, an article. So I'm going to up the game a little bit here. Um, so this is um, a, um, a review article that's going to be looking at uh, the effect that anxiety has on our brains, okay? And um, and and then relate it back to the health consequences that we've talked about from the neck down, okay? So we're, you know, we're, again, we're reviewing this, okay? We're looking at it from lots of different angles so that you're going to have a very, very solid understanding. And that's the goal of this, okay? So this is, um, in, the, in this article, they put out the key points, okay? And they talk about, Pathological anxiety and chronic stress. Okay, if you if you're not able to manage this, then of, yes, you are going to be ruminating and you're going to increase your levels of stress hormones. And again, the, you know you have the two different uh, trajectories. You have the hardwired catecholamines, which are the adrenaline that causes problems when all the when when it's active all the time. If you're always releasing adrenaline, you're going to have Elevated blood pressure, you're going to have immune dis, uh, dysfunction, immune suppression, okay? And um, and then the cortisol, okay? And and the cortisol, again, um, causes uh, a, tr a transformation where you actually will take muscle proteins and liver proteins and turn them into fat. Um, you uh, uh, have this chronic fat-based um, uh, inflammation the cortisol hormone and the, the, the elevated free fatty acids in your blood from your body fat causes insulin resistance, and then you then have the trajectory towards diabetes, all right? So um, so we see that chronic stress um, is also increases the risk of a number of psychiatric disorders, okay? And it can, is, you know, there's two different ways we're going to look at this. One is just what I was talking about, okay, the diabetes and inflammation. And then we're looking at the direct effect that Sapolsky and the people in the first um, week of class talked about, and that is the effect that cortisol has on causing a shrinkage, okay, of the hippocampus, okay, which is our learning and memory center. And also, it's the one that looks back and projects forward in terms of, hey, I remember what happened last time I did this. Maybe we have a plan moving forward. And then we have the um, frontal cortex. Specifically, they talk about the prefrontal cortex, the PFC, okay? And remember, cortisol caused degeneration and loss in that area too. And the prefrontal cortex is weighing all of our insight from the hippocampus 
and is then making decisions on how to act. And that's what your prefrontal cortex does. You're, it's, it is your executive, okay? And you'll hear reference to the executive function. I'm sorry, I don't want to sneeze. It's, my allergies have been so, so significant this year. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm fronting off my, uh, my sneeze. Um, but yes, the, your prefrontal cortex is your executive. It, it, it decides at any moment in time, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. And then there is acute decision-making, emotional-based learning. That's all, I mean, um, emotional-based learning and decision-making. That's all here in the front. And it, again, it shrinks when we get older, okay? So, and, and shrinks when we are experiencing stress. So, I'm not relative to age, no, but shrinks during stress. That was a little bit of misspeak right there, all right? All right, so... So it can contribute to the affective disorders, okay? The clinical depression, it can contribute to cognitive decline, all right? Um, in fact, um, just to give guys some insight, okay? When we look at clinical depression, okay? And this is the most significant affective disorder worldwide. Um, we look at the treatment approaches, okay? The, the problem is the control center which is your prefrontal cortex that is usually going out there telling the amygdala, yeah, we got this, okay? Don't overreact, don't be overactive, let's lower their stress, it's all good, okay? But if it shrinks, then the amygdala kind of has this free running approach, okay? So when we look at therapeutic approaches, let's say we're um, taking um, uh, uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors okay so this would be like prozac um this would be like um trintalex okay this would be like zoloft okay and their ultimate goal down the line is to cause the um you you elevate serotonin okay um and uh through a very complicated process, I'm not going to get there. It changes receptor function, et cetera. It takes weeks to, to, to engage. But ultimately, you're going to have regrowth of the prefrontal cortex. And this is seen scientifically, okay? And this regrowth gives you then process, the, the, the cognitive power, the infrastructure of the brain to go in there and, um, and control your emotions and control the amygdala and and slow down your role in terms of reacting to stress, all right? So that's a key concept of what antidepressants do. The um, more modern therapeutic approach is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And uh, um, light magnetic pulses, multiple theories of therapies over a six week period of time, okay? And um, if anybody who knows anything about physics and electronics, if you take a wire and run a magnet over that wire, what happens is the wire conducts electricity. And by increasing the electrical activity of individual wires, your axons and your brain cells, um, and the dendrites and the connections, then this area grows. So the, again, the, 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 the approach is to grow. Third approach, cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay, This would be um, meditation, learning how to react, things like that. It's when you have learning and memory, you get growth. And so it's, it is, it forces cognitive behavioral therapy, this area to grow and then gain control of the brain areas that are out of control when you're stressed out. All right, so that's what all this is all about, okay? And they talk about it right here, that there's evidence that the prefrontal cortex in the hippocampus, okay, they have growth and neurogenesis that can be restored either pharmacologically or non-pharmacological interventions, like I said, using transcranial magnetic stimulation or even better, using homeopathic measures. Um, and, uh, you know, you, can, you, you, you get direction from a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and then you take it on as part of your new lifestyle approach. You go for walks. You go for um, swims in the ocean. You, you do forest bathing. Um, surround yourself with supportive people. Get yourself a couple crazy dogs. These are the measures that are taken. All right? Awesome. Okay, so that's what this is all about. Don't forget, okay, that you should be, you know, you have five questions here on the quiz to take care of. And then what we do here is we, in the discussion prompt, we're asking you to address the very things I was talking about. You can use this paper that we're gonna, I'm going to do a quick look at right here. And then this is a different approach right here. Um, slightly older, but it talks about um, 
um, the type 2 diabetes connection. Okay, um, part of it is the the inflammation and the decline in the um, um, the selectivity of the blood-brain barrier in the blood vessels. So so inflammatory uh, parts of our immune system get into the brain and wreak havoc. And the other part is um, when you have insulin receptor insensitivity, there are uh, insulin receptors in nerve cells that cause the brain cells to grow. And as they become insensitive, then they don't grow as much. So that's, that's the connection right here that they're talking about here, reflecting back on stress to diabetes and diabetes to these problems, okay? All right, very cool. So that's what this is all about. So um, let's... Uh, Go ahead and and go ahead and jump into this paper right here. Okay, all right. There is a link uh, to the URL, but it does have a paywall, and so the best thing you can do is just access the um, the article the way I did right here. Okay, all right. So I've already reviewed all of what's going on here. Uh, there's terms of art here that you start to get comfortable with: the prefrontal cortex, our executive, our decision maker. Okay, right here, emotional learning and emotional control. Uh, the hippocampus, this is just hardcore learning and memory. Um, this one takes in the information from our past and projects forward in terms of how to handle different aspects of our life, different hurdles, different stressors, okay? And um, so they go through it. And so this is a chance to kind of to read it and, and, and review it and to know that now you guys have the capability to read this scientific review paper, all right? Very cool stuff, all right? So they talk about... Um, anxiety and fear, okay? Again, the, the way I remember the amygdala is A for anxiety, A for fear, okay? And what they don't have in here is A for anger, okay? And stress will tap into this, okay? Um, and and what, they, what they talk about is that um, chronic anxiety, okay, uh, that creates fear, okay? And um, and it initiates the stress response. This is a maladaptive state, okay? This is not good for you being able to handle your life moving forward, not good for your overall physiology, all right? And it's pathological. So they got to go through all that, all right? And that is the point of this early part. They go through the circuitry, all right, that we were just talking about, the triad of the amygdala out of control, okay, that grows with stress, and then the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, okay, that are shrinking, and those are our control systems. So you need to do therapy, okay, train yourself to get everything back into register, and that's the whole point of this, all right? Awesome. Okay, so this is uh, from the Blackboard page. I just uh, copied this and put this in, all right? They, uh, they go over the circuitry, okay, of fear and anxiety, okay, again, the big A here, the big A, um, is the key element is the amygdala, and they kind of show this here. I know this is kind of daunting, but our amygdala is down, located down here on the bottom, okay? And you see our prefrontal cortex up here. It's always going down trying to control this, okay? Trying to keep it from getting out of control, all right? And they, they call this, this is fancy talk, it's for psychology, fear conditioning. You know what we also call that? You guys have probably heard this. This is called exposure therapy, okay? So if you have lots of anxiety about something, you learn to expose yourself to it and learn that, hey, bad things didn't happen, even though I have a lot of anxiety about that. And if you do this over and over and over again, then this guy is able to shut down the overactivation of the amygdala, all right? Very cool. Uh, down here, they show the hippocampus, all right? Down here, this part of the brain, all right? Hippocampus is always communicating with the decision maker. That's what this is. Decision maker is informing the hippocampus, exploding out the memories, okay? And we're always going this way, okay? So you see the triad. It's also the hippocampus is, is telling the amygdala, hey, can you shut it off, okay? All righty. However, remember that this guy shrinks, and this guy shrinks, and this guy grows. And that's what that's all about right there, okay? under the stressful condition that is not taken under control. So we have this top-down process of trying to control this very lizard-like, just, you know, basic way of, um, of surviving. Okay, i got to show you over here. Sorry, this is too much fun. So there's Desi and Lucy. Hey, Lucy, come here. Come here. Come here, guys. Come here, guys. Yeah, they come. They look like panthers. Ah, there's Lucy. There's the girl dog right there. She's a big one too. She's pretty awesome. Okay. 
Very, very nice doggies. Okay, go by. Okay. They're pretty cool. <laughs> Except when squirrels arrive. Then their basic fight or flight <laughs> response takes over. And all they know is they want to go hunt, you know, and they don't listen to anything. But uh, So we're trying to give them some top-down cognitive processing to control their fight or flight system, right? And that's what we want you guys to train your clients to doing. And we also want you to um, also think about it in terms of your overall, overall life, okay? All right, so they go through this circuitry, okay? Um, we heard about this involuntary stress response, the autonomic nervous system, okay? That's what we're talking about. It's unconscious. We reflected on that. And then again, these are the guys that are trying to control it, the top-down guys. The prefrontal cortex, there are different components to it. And again, uh, it interacts with the hippocampus, okay? That is super important in terms of memory, okay? And it contextualizes everything. And that's what we're talking about by interacting with the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal, cor prefrontal cortex is just like, hey, this is, you know, I'm trying to orchestrate a plan, okay? And then it reaches out to the hippocampus and says, so last time something like this, kind of similar like this happened, what do we do? What do we do, okay? And uh, from that, then you have a plan moving forward to suppress. Hi, buddy. Here's... um. That's Desi. Um, you know what it is? It's dinner time. Suddenly, I'm a popular guy here. Okay. All right. So um, it, we uh, we then can. I want you guys to. There's my doggies. Somebody just came home. I think um, that's my oldest son. And uh, yes, we have what we call a multi-gen household going on here. Um, anyway, so uh, this is the fight or flight response that we've already done. We've gone over this. So read it. It'll reinvigorate your memory of that, okay? Help the hippocampus grow, all right? Um, and then it gets in here in this later phase right here about this circuitry when it's out of balance, okay? Um, how it creates the pathology, okay? Sorry, there we go. I'm just gonna, there. And that pathology is the effect of disorders, okay? It can be um, clinical depression, okay? We see right here. Um, it can contribute to uh, schizophrenia, all right, bipolar disease. It's seen in PTSD. That means it's out of register. It's not working well. And, okay, long-term is a contributing factor to developing dementia, Alzheimer's disease being the most uh, well-recognized and the most common form of dementia, okay? All righty, so that's what that's all about. We go, we've already talked about the hippocampal damage and what happens where cortisol causes it to de degenerate, okay? And then in here, they talk about treatments, okay? So it gives it relevance, okay? Uh, whether it be uh, a mood stabilizer like lithium for bipolar disease, um, or we can give, uh, like I said, looking at uh, traditional antidepressants. They all seem to bring the amygdala activity down, so it's gonna reduce the amygdala activity, and it's gonna increase the activity of the prefrontal cortex and um, and the control the prefrontal cortex has over everything. All righty, so that's what that was all about. So while daunting, see, you guys got it, and you guys totally, totally, totally have this, okay? All righty. Um, the other thing to think about here, okay, when, so that's one big risk factor. The other risk factor, of course, is diabetes, okay? we all in agreement that cortisol um, causes this um, inappropriate release of glucose into the bloodstream that gets then turned to fat, okay? The core, the also, this is beyond this class, but what happens when you have a lot of glucose, it actually causes what's called a sugar um, attachment to proteins and lipids. It's um, um, fancy talk. It's called an advanced glycation end product. And what happens is the proteins don't work right. They're candy coated. And now like, for example, your elastin and collagen there's your blood vessels that go like this, okay? Um, they have now an attachment of glucose because you have high blood glucose, and uh, guess what happens? You have then hypertension, okay? So, so it's very, very real, okay? So this is a little bit of a, a mini review, okay, about that issue, okay? We'll go right in here, and I kind of outline it as always in, in the um, in the uh, um, um, blackboard text, okay? All righty, so we don't need this. We'll go like that, all right? <clears throat> and just I want you to, to take your time with this 
and just kind of um, ease through it, right? So this particular one, the arrow's not working, so you just use your little hand. You read this, and it shows you this this um, this continuum of diabetes and Alzheimer's degeneration. Okay. In fact, <clears throat> when you look at again the epidemiology, where we look at hundreds of thousands of people, we could look at millions of people over many studies. That's called a meta-analysis. Many studies. There's one thing that rings true and that the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is diabetes, okay? Um, studies have shown that you, if you combine people that are at risk for diabetes in that pre-diabetic condition or people that are full-blown diabetics, um, and we then look at people, you know, whether or not they have Alzheimer's, 80%, 80% of Alzheimer's cases um, are diabetics, okay? So that is pretty significant, all right? And as a result, uh, people you know, that study this aspect of science refer to diabetes, I mean, to refer to Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes. You know, refer to type 1, that's being juvenile onset diabetes, where it's an out of control immune system. Type 2, it's genetic predisposition and a long life of really poor dietary habits and lack of exercise, stress. And then if you don't bring it under control, Type 3 diabetes would be the outcome that happens at 60s and 70 years of age where you now have Alzheimer's disease, okay? So that's what that's all about, all right? So, so um, read through this, okay? Um, it may seem intense, okay? But I know you guys can do it, so I'm just going what in this particular case for my PDF file, I'm hitting the next page, and then I can use, use my da downward arrow, okay? Or I can use my up, um, my um, my little hand to read through it. I just want you to to take the the basics of this. They talk up up here about inflammation, okay? Um, and it, you know it's interesting. It says inhibitor of BCL2, okay? Guess what? Um, uh, one of the cancer treatments for Julie Julie is going to be using is called a BCL2 inhibitor, and that was venetoclax, or some people call it venetoclax, okay? That's another here nor there, okay? So. Um, Look at the, the the relationship of some of the chemical messengers down here, um, and why we think that Alzheimer's is a continuum of diabetes called type three diabetes. And again, it it shows you how important it is to keep it under control. Um, we see over here that we have this resistance to, like I said, insulin, and then insulin-like growth factor. These are hormones that um, that are in excess when you're a diabetic condition and for reasons of inflammation, like we said, from cortisol as well. So we have free fatty acids, inflammation, and cortisol. So those are three reasons now that cause the receptors to IGF and insulin to become less efficient. And then you then have less brain growth. And that's what this is all about right here, all right? So you can read through that, okay? Very cool. All righty. And so they talk about impairments in this system that can lead to, all right, metabolic dysfunction, oxidative stress. Your brain is 2% of your body mass, utilizing 30% of your oxygen and glucose, okay? So it's highly metabolic. And if things are not kept in tight control, then you get what's called oxidative damage. So they relate this, you know, this uh, diabetic-like condition of resistance to this risk for oxidative damage in the brain. It's like the perfect storm, okay? And they then connect it to the pathology. Um, in a horse and cart, people are finally coming around to the idea that when we look at um, uh, neurofibrillary tangles, okay, um, uh, it's one part of it, and amyloid plaques, that these are kind of the, the cart, but the horse has to do with inflammation and and um, and and resistance to to uh, insulin resistance because the receptors are not working right. So anyway, if you check it, take a look here. We're all done here. I know it seems intense. You get the best you can, the most you can out of that. Okay. We then end with a, a, an overview that a video. It's about 20 minutes long that reflects upon this. Okay. All right. So that's how you approach this second module for week two. Uh, have no fear, my friends. Um, you just I always have um, in all my classes that are my future doctors, I give them intense readings like this, and I tell them, you know what, don't don't get caught up in the details. Just read it and try and lower your stress, 
enjoy the read, okay, and get as much as you can out of it. Don't worry about the details because the details are not that important, okay? All right, just get a flavor for what's going on. All right, my friends, so that is it for right now. And you have a good week, and we'll get back to you later. And we're going to start. Uh, we, we did a little bit grading, looking, and, and sorry, I'm, I'm doing my ADHD thing up here. Um, and I have it. I have it all the ADHD, which made me really successful. So there you go. Um, if um, when, when what we do uh, during the, earlier in the week, Julie and I were doing a little bit of individual grading on the discussion, um, we're going to. Uh, continue to grade through tomorrow night because that's when it's due and then you can click on your grade book and you can get our feedback on our 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 just usually it's just us being a cheerleader saying how awesome it is that you've looked at this and looked at this okay but that's a way to 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 know that we're in there and that we're monitoring things and we're loving and enjoying what you've done so far which we already have all right okay guys peace and we'll see you next week